curve progression. And I would first like to say this is not a perfect science. And we kind of alluded to this earlier, but it would be way easier for you as parents, for us as providers, if kids could tell us what their curves were going to end up as. And we all hope that someday we'll understand the mystery that's hidden in their DNA so we have a better understanding of this. And we do have some things that we know about in terms of particular conditions. So I'll try to highlight those. But you know, we are still not able to predict this accurately in the like most common type of uh, scoliosis that we see uh, with genetic testing. So we're a long way off after from being able to make these predictions in neuromuscular cases. But we do know uh, past behavior is the most reliable predictor of future behavior. This is true in a lot of areas of life, including uh, when we're looking at scoliosis. So it's really valuable to see how x-rays are changing over time. And basically, you know, this is going to be a combination of the rate of progression and the amount of birth remaining, which is why a lot of these uh, uh, situations and journeys in early onset scoliosis are much more like a marathon than a sprint. Dr. Barr already talked about the fact that there are two uh, peaks in terms of uh, growth. And so there's this birth to age five and then 10 to adulthood. And that's when we tend to see the most progression is when they're going through the most growth. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you know everybody is tall ends up with a bad scoliosis. So it's each curve's tendency. There are a couple clues we can get in some specific cases. So infantile idiopathic scoliosis is one that actually will oftentimes correct on its own, but certainly not always. Uh, and we can see that uh, based on how the ribs uh, interact with the spine, we can oftentimes tell whether or not it's going to improve or progress. And so that's, if you hear about the rib vertebral angle, that's what we're talking about. And if it's less than 20, those oftentimes get better on their own. If it's bigger than that, they usually progress. Other things uh, that we look for are things like congenital uh, deformities. So we've seen a couple uh, examples of this, like when you have a hemi vertebrae or half of a vertebrae, and we expect that there's going to be some progression of that over time. There's lots of different types of these, um, and you can see that some of them are when the bones didn't separate completely, and some of them are when you formed extra bone. And so based on what type of deformity it is, we have some ability to say if they're a high or low risk of progression. And there are also some other types of curves uh, that we know have particular uh, reputation. So one of these uh, that kind of got brought up a little bit this morning is neurofibromatosis. And we can uh, see when there's these sharp angular curves, those uh, in neurofibromatosis tend to progress rapidly. Unfortunately, um, this uh, patient was a little unsure as to whether or not they wanted any intervention, and you can see that, as we kind of expect, it progressed very uh, aggressively. <clears throat> Other conditions uh, that we see um, uh, are some of the muscular dystrophies, particularly Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So this is something that uh, usually the scoliosis doesn't show up until uh, the children lose their ability to ambulate and are more in their teenage years. Um, prior to the onset of steroids for treatment, this was almost everybody with Duchenne's, but now fortunately with steroids, the rate of that has dropped down to about one in five, but it still can be uh, aggressive curves. And this, um, so this slide just is to kind of highlight the point where the lines diverge, uh, that is where surgery was done. And so in this study, we're not going to make the lung function get a whole lot better or turn it around, but we can slow the progression of that. So that's why you want to try to act on the earlier side so that we prevent it from uh, getting very severe. And here's just an example of, you know, surgery can be done at these different points, but if you're uh, the case on the left, the surgery and the recovery is a lot smoother and easier in general uh, than the uh, amount of work and surgery that you have to go through if you're like the situation on the right. Spinal muscular atrophy is another uh, condition that can progress really rapidly. And here you oftentimes also have a lot of deformity that can uh, develop in the lungs. So both of these kids had uh, surgery to make their spine straighter, uh, but the one that had it at an earlier age, you can see how much uh, they've expanded, and the one on the right has really uh, already got a lot of lung deformity. Another opportunity we don't want to miss, and we mentioned this before, is that a lot of um, uh, cases where we see that there 
is either a fluid collection called a syrinx or a, what we call a Chiari malformation where um, the brain's sitting a little bit low. If we see those things on MRI in these atypical curves, then oftentimes by intervening and treating that underlying issue, then the curve will never get worse. So those are opportunities we don't want to miss. We always want to be able to look out for something that we could treat that would prevent the scoliosis from uh, progressing. So in summary, I would say predicting progression is still a very imperfect science. Infantile idiopathic curves that have a low rib angle, those oftentimes will resolve on their own. We actually kick them out of setting scoliosis straight because they get straight. Um, <laughs> it's normal, but, um, and then uh, congenital scoliosis, there's uh, different types, and some of these have more aggressive reputations, but we basically want to follow them and see how each child is behaving. And then there's certain conditions where we have to be on the lookout because the curves can progress very quickly, and if we can act sooner, then we can hopefully prevent them from needing a surgery that has more risk um, and prevent their lung function from being impacted. As much. And then again, we're always on the lookout for spinal cord issues that by treating them we may be able to halt progression. Has we treated uh, with different methods going back for even centuries with uh, corrected devices like cast or hanging cast or some of the devices like traction, uh, but it was not really uh, a good understanding of early onset scoliosis. We looked at the curves and we were just seeing what we can do uh, with this curve. In the early 80s, I saw Patrick in my clinic. And Patrick was three and a half years of age. And for the first time, I thought that really is not the curve that bothers him, bothers him, but it was shortness of breath and you know, difficulty in breathing that uh, was brought in and it came with the, with the tank of oxygen. At that time, we didn't have really a lot of uh, techniques that we have today. And we ended up uh, fusing the spine and correcting the spine in two or three uh, type of stages. But uh, after two years, we could not save Patrick. And that was the beginning of my interest in early onset scoliosis, that we are there, but we don't, we can't do anything uh, for these children. We all thought that the, the progression of the curve, like in this case of congenital scoliosis, was the reason. But again, it was really the breathing, the pulmonary function that really was important, because the pulmonary function, as you can see in these uh, curves, would uh, bring early death in patients with early onset scoliosis. And that's not true in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis because they don't have really usually died from, uh, from the disease. Uh, Bob Campbell uh, uh, brought us more information and point the thoracic insufficiency syndrome that you probably will hear. And uh, we know now that the patients who have thoracic insufficiency syndrome, they have a poor quality of life, really, very compatible to other pediatric diseases like asthma, J JRA, heart transplantation, and so on. So it is really a big problem with patients who develop scoliosis and early in early age, you know, necessarily you know, under the ten, ten, year, 10 years of age. From 50s to 60s, we have some techniques that developed by uh, Harrington. You all have heard about Harrington uh, uh, technique. At the same time, um, uh, Alan was the person in the UK that developed Alan Jack. They all developed some methods of distracting the spine and making it straight. And that was the, some of the early uh, x-rays of these patients who were able to uh, uh, distract and correct, correct the curve. And Harrington was the first who really recognized that the uh, instrumentation uh, in children under the age of 10 should not accompany with fusion, because fusion would make the spine short, and when the spine is short, the whole chest and thoracic spine becomes small, and the lung is following, and there would be a very small lung, small capacity of the lungs, and they cannot really improve their breathing. So these are, at the time, especially with neuromuscular scoliosis, which started with polio, 
they were uh, lung machines, that they were helping these children to breathe and, uh, and develop from that uh, scoliosis. These are the patients who uh, had fusion in early age and then uh, ended up with a very short spine and very short lung and the patient couldn't really survive for many years. Uh, however, some of them, it was good in those days that they didn't have even hand instrumentation. The patient uh, on the left side in 1951 and the uh, one at 57, it shows development and progression of the curve. And you can see that they were fused without any instrumentation because uh, non-union, the middle uh, 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 case, and then uh, had, at that time then had the high instrumentation in 1965 and was able to control the curve. So those you know, early development helped many children who suffered from poliomyelitis, neuromuscular scoliosis, and early on scoliosis. But the other methods of traction, uh, you know, different types of traction help, uh, you know, from ancient time to now, and used for preoperative uh, reform. And even the external fixation, when you have pins in the back, was used, but it really wasn't very successful, and it's, it's not in the use anymore. So from then, we really don't have a lot of history on the treatment of areas of scoliosis, but going forward, uh, it was a time of Lukey, well, Lukey, the surgeon from Mexico, who developed Lukey trolley, and putting wires in the spine and the rod, and that really started to, um, uh, without fusion, and the uh, spine was growing inside those uh, uh, wires, and uh, also we had this uh, uh, rod go through the pelvis, which is very common in patients with neuromuscular scoliosis, and now we're using different, you know, advanced methods of that. Then uh, the uh, methods developed uh, later on recently it will be discussed and covered by the next speakers, which is a, a, a rod uh, technique that is fused in the middle, and then the rods extend and is loose at the top and the bottom, the spine sort of grows in the direction that we want. Uh, staples and tether, these are all devices that put in the kind of left side of the curve and the left kind of cave side uh, of the curve sort of you know, grow. And again, these are more probably for, for older children, but the, all this type of uh, um, the growth modulation, we, we call it. So trying to address the growth and the control of the curve at the same time. We want to make sure that the curve doesn't get worse, but also allow the patient to grow normally. And these are some hybrid mix techniques, and these are all uh, growing raw techniques that is now being more used. Uh, you can see the uh, you know, many years of growth, uh, 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 growth friendly treatment, and, uh, and then finally with all the complications that we had, the patient can be uh, treated. This is a vector, a, per, a device that was put in the ribs, we're going to be uh, talked about. And the uh, latest and greatest is the magic uh, device that is uh, a magnetically controlled growing rod that we uh, apply and, and allow the patients to grow and then we uh, lengthen the spine in the clinic, in the office, versus taking them to the operating room and have another surgery, another anesthesia. And this uh, it seems to be the uh, common trend, and we uh, just uh, finished a study that uh, now it con uh, it, uh, consists of uh, probably about 85% of growth-friendly uh, techniques that we have. This is the device we lengthened it in the, in, in the uh, office. Uh, so in summary, we have come a long way, thanks to increased level of interest and the uh, uh, research by study groups. Uh, we collect data that is directly helps us to understand the problems and deal with it uh, in different ways. Um, and still a lot to learn. Uh, and I think this uh, uh, continued research would help us uh, to improve our uh, quality of care uh, for years to come. And we encourage everyone to participate in, in, in research uh, programs. And thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker will be uh
Uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, it's really nice to hear the parent perspective all through the morning, and I hope we can take this time this afternoon with a smaller group to learn a little bit more about our early on kids and neuromuscular kids that have some different complexities than what we've been talking about this morning. Um, feel free to ask questions. Um, you know, obviously we want to learn about how we treat curvatures uh, in the spine in our young kids, but to do that, it's important to know how the spine normally grows and how it should grow and, uh, and how we can hopefully try to get as close to that as possible. So we're going to go over that now. Um, you know, my disclosure related to our topic. So the spine really starts to develop about three to four weeks after conception. And by seven to eight weeks, you can start to see some of the growth plates uh, in the spine. So if you look on that top picture on the right, uh, there's a primary growth center in the front of the spine, and then two growth centers in the back that help form that ring around the neurologic system, the spinal cord, uh, which also is, starts to develop around three to four weeks. Now this spine, the, the total height of the uh, child will, will increase rapidly. I have an iPhone here, um, and that represents, you know, you can kind of visualize it, that is the size of the thoracic spine in a newborn. So from T1 to T12 is about the size of your iPhone, T1 to S1, that represents the whole spine excluding the neck. So from the base of the neck down to the tailbone, it's about the size of the number two pencil. Uh, and that's where it is when you are born. We want to make sure that continues to grow. And the specific numbers are in your handout if you want the specific dimensions. The overall height of a newborn will increase 350% uh, to adulthood. So the thoracic spine on the left here will over double in size by the time you get to become an adult, and then the T1 to S1 segment will increase from about 19 to 45 centimeters, so about 17 inches from the base of the neck down to the tailbone when you're fully grown. The overall spine triples in height. You know, some people mentioned this morning um, looking at the side view and how that's important, especially for long term quality of life. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> important to know that when we're born, our spines look a lot like what you see in A. Uh, mammals and vertebrates, you know, vertebrates are animals with backbones. Ones that use all four legs for moving often just keep that rounded back their whole life. So think of like dogs, horses, cows. Uh, but as we mature, as we start getting control of holding our head up, right, we start developing that sway in the neck that you see in B and C. And as we start walking, we'll develop a sway in the lower back and, and trying to maintain this normal side profile, you might hear called sagittal profile or lateral profile, uh, is an important part of considering how to treat kids. You know, uh, bones grow, you know, this is sort of the you know, typical thought of a bone, like your, your upper arm bone, the humerus, or your femur, or your thigh bone. It's relatively simple. You'll have growth on either end. You can see those growth plates, right? They grow and they get longer, the bone may get a little wider also. The spine's a lot more complicated, so that you can see just the shape of the spine is very different. Now all the vertebrae look the same when you're a newborn, and as again you start gaining head control and walking, the specific shapes of each vertebra will change based on what muscles attach and what its function is. But you can see there's a lot of growth plates, so we'll have these two in the front, the top and bottom have a growth center, and all these different processes you see here, those different points of attachment for muscle, the ones that go out to the side are called the transverse processes. The ones that come out the back that you can kind of feel the bumps on your back, those are the spinous processes. So they even have well, kind of secondary growth centers as well. So you know, all told, you have 34 vertebrae when you're born. You have over 100 growth plates in the spine. So understanding its growth, it's a lot trickier than uh, what we think of when we think of our traditional bone growth. We've learned about it through collections. Uh, there's a skeletal collection in Cleveland that's uh, extensively measured and continues to be measured to get more precise tools. We can learn about the dimensions of the spine and how it grows. People are using uh, MRI images, CT scans, things like that to kind of better understand how the spine grows because we want to maintain that growth in our young kids. Like Dr. Barney told us, if you just fuse it down very early, then you inhibit the growth of the chest and lungs, and that can cause problems. You know, he showed some unfortunate cases of kids who are dying as toddlers because their lungs aren't able to give them enough oxygen. Um, the man on the right did a lot of measurements of uh, Professor DiMeglio of kids' weights and heights, longitudinal over time, so it's given us a lot of parameters about what is normal growth. So this kind of rough chart, from zero to one, there's a tremendous amount of growth. So a newborn to age one, 
will grow 25 centimeters in height. That's the same amount that you grow in all the years of puberty. From age one to two, your spine continues to grow at a very rapid rate. So by age two, your spine is actually two-thirds the size of an adult spine. And then things slow down, and then they pick back up in puberty. Typically for girls, it's roughly around 11, boys roughly around 13, but it obviously varies. You'll again have a growth rate that upticks again, similar to the level that you had from age one to two for a few years. And in the end, what you want, hopefully, is something like this which is a well-balanced spine from the front, nice and straight, normal bone and rib development. And from the side, you see that nice side contours. Um, and that's what we are striving for. And so some of my colleagues to, uh, later today are going to talk about some of the things that we're doing in the early onset neuromuscular realm to try to get as close to this as possible. the information, make sure that it kind of sinks in, but also, you know, where we're repetitive is where we are really focusing a lot of our attention on and where, really where a lot of this stuff seems really important. So, uh, I'm going to be talking about spine growth again, but really curve, in its relationship to curve direction and then the heart lung. So, again, the challenge with early onset, which really challenges us as physicians and obviously translates to challenge and in working with uh, children with early onset scoliosis is that scoliosis worsens with growth. And growth is obviously an important for lung development. Scoliosis is bad for lung development. And then the problem is, is the treatment that you were kind of hearing about in the other room that we would frequently do and we've been doing for a long time is growth limiting. So it's this circular problem where if we start using techniques that we apply to older patients or older adolescents, we wouldn't necessarily accomplish really the primary goal of our treatment is really allowing for maximal development of the patient. So again, kind of without harping too much about, you know, we have a substantial amount of growth. There is substantial from birth through five years, and then we really see another kind of uptick around puberty. The problem is that growth not only affects the development of the spine, it affects the development of the thoracic cage itself. So this is what your vault, this is what all of our growth was, or is going to be for the patients that are in here, what we'd like it to be. And so the spine, as it lengthens, that means the rib cage lengthens as well. But in that same time frame, the spine or the, the rib cage is also widening. And so some of those things are going to be directly affected by and by the interventions that we do. Lung development, so there's a lot of things that go into lung development. The lung is just a big vac full of air that then allows our blood to kind of come in and exchange the oxygen that's in that air uh, and then kind of the carbon dioxide that we breathe out. And those, uh, we have a substantial increase from birth to even by four years of age of how many little tiny bags of uh, lung we have in our uh, chest cage. The airways, kind of the, the, the things that allows the air to pass through, they, they're kind of developed uh, before birth. And then the blood vessels that allow for that exchange of oxygenation, they really develop to the size of the lung um, and to the size of the thorax, and not specifically to the age, to the age of the patient. So what happens with uh, the thoracic cage and the chest with scoliosis? Well, you can see in spine deformity, there's a couple things. It can reduce thoracic volume. So the, the rib cage starts to get shortened as our spine gets shortened, right? The other problem is that these ribs right here, now this is a person that has scoliosis, but these ribs here look a little bit more normal. And you know, if you all grab your rib cage and take a deep breath, you feel that there's motion. Your ribs actually kind of go a little bit up and down. Well, these ribs right here are, are not as effective in doing that. So when we're looking at treating these patients, we're really trying to maximize their lung function and ultimately their lung development. Now there are some things that we can try to do to see how well we're doing things. And so some, some of our patients have already had lung function tests. Unfortunately, the younger the patient, the more difficult it is actually to assess their lung function. Um, but the, work, the, the things that we're concerned about is just overall lung volumes, smaller chest cage, smaller volumes. And then the amount of like blowing out a candle 
the force at which you kind of breathe is going to be affected by, again, the motility of that rib cage. So there are things that we as orthopedists will look at when we look at x-rays. We'll look at see, you know, how much of the lung field is around the, the, uh, the height uh, of the thoracic cage. And there are things we can do with CT and MRI to look at it three-dimensionally. And then we just answer simple questions, right? We want to know how are you with regards to, you know, hospitalizations, pneumonias, other things like that. And those are kind of ways we look at um, seeing how the lung function is doing. So as we kind of look at all of this for this session, it really kind of revolves around, you know, what are we trying to manage? We're trying to manage the spine because the spine has an effect on our lungs, our heart, our lung development, and so forth. And so that's how, that's what we're focused on. But we're focused on it through doing it with the spine. Now, the other thing that we do need to talk about is obviously we heard earlier today, for those that were earlier um, in the morning session, is that our heart's there as well. And I think there is a big fear that, okay, lung function, and then you really worry about heart function. We probably don't see routine heart problems or heart dysfunction in the average scoliosis. Obviously, the more severe the scoliosis, the more severe deformity the potential, the greater effect. Or there are some conditions that can both cause scoliosis and cause a heart problem as well. But in general, we're worried, more a, lot, we're worried a lot more about the lungs than we are about the heart. But again, we care about it all. Great, thank you. So, I'll talk a little bit on some of the things that we do to try to manage here. First, we'll be uh, Dr. Glasbecker uh, from Boston. We'll talk about bracing cancer. Sorry, this room's not very good for uh, just my hands stand up here, but that's okay. So, my task is to talk about casting. Oh, you can hear me in the back, right? Uh -huh. No one's ever said that talk too quietly. So, um, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about casting and bracing for early onset scoliosis, which, um, and here are the goals. I want to talk a little bit why does early onset scoliosis need treatment, what options are available, which treatment is best, when do you intervene, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the emotional side of this and how easy or hard is this. So I had to talk about two people that I need now. This is a family of mine who actually wrote a blog on our website that talked a little bit about the emotional aspect of taking care of a kid who's being casted. We're going to talk about that. And also, if you have not seen this book, this is a book that's been written by a patient whose kid was treated in a cast, and it's called Cole and Crooked Pop Flower. And I'm going to talk a little bit about bracing and casting and the concept of this book. So Cole looked down in his garden, and he saw a flower that was not quite as straight as the other flowers and wanted to grow a little bit more crooked. So why should we treat? Well, the natural history of a lot of curves when you're growing fast and when you're little, we just heard about how much the spine grows, is that they get worse. And if they get worse, they can affect your lungs and have other issues on your organs. So Cole went out to the garden, he saw the other flowers continue to grow straight, but this one continued to grow a little bit more crooked. So what are the treatment options? Well, there's lots of treatment options for early onset scoliosis. So when Cole looked at his flower, tried to give it water, it didn't work. He said, well, milk makes my bones strong, so I'm going to give it milk. This made the flower soggy. He tried to hang up like his mom does, the clothes on the clothesline. That didn't work either, just pull off the pedals. His sister straightened her hair with a flat iron. That didn't work either. So, lots of options. So, what are our treatment options? Well, we can observe, right? So not all these curves are going to get worse. And before you want to intervene, you want to make sure that indeed it's getting worse. So before Cole tried any of those things, he wanted to make sure it continued to get there. We can brace kids, we can cast kids, and then some of these kids will also need surgery. <coughs> So which is best? So Cole was upset. He went to the doctor and said, nothing's worked, doc. What do I do? And so um, the reality is when we look at our options, surgery is not perfect. It is pretty good, but there are challenges. So early surgery is associated with more complications. And over time, we achieve less lengthening. So for these reasons, we try to delay surgery as much as possible. Cole tried surgery as well. He tried to staple the flower up to a piece of wood. All of a sudden, the water couldn't get to the flowers and it wilted. So surgery didn't work so well for him either. Now, we know bracing works, so bracing works in adolescence, but we have never really proven necessarily that it works in young kids. So can we use this information to say that bracing will work in early onset scoliosis as well? So bracing has an advantage, and then you can take the cast off, the brace off. Why is that an advantage? Well, kids like to run around, they like to get in the pool, they like to get dirty, and so being able to take them off allows them to get outside of that. What's the disadvantage? You can take it off. So the problem is, is if you have something you can take off, you're going to get arguments with you. And trust me, the little kids are just as manipulative as the teenagers, right? My three and a half year old manipulate me all the time. So um, that leads to some compliance issues and smart. What about casting? Well, think about a cast as a supercharged brace, right? 
you put it on in the operating room, you can push with greater force, you can get better molding, maybe get better correction, and compliance is no longer an issue because they can't take the cast off. You can also make fun designs, so this is a ladybug that I made for her first birthday party. So what are disadvantage casting? Well, you can't take it off, right? So you can't bathe, it's hot. You can't go in the pool. Parents don't, can't hug their child like the way they normally do. And there's some concern about repetitive anesthesia. So the question is, does casting work? Well, it depends what we define as success. So success could mean curing the curve, which we can sometimes do, but it could also mean delaying surgery. So Cole's last trick was he put a straw around the flower to see what happened. And I'm going to tell you what happened to this in a second. So what about when do you intervene? Well, we know if you think the curve is going to get worse, that doing it earlier at a smaller curve works better. That makes intuitive sense. So younger age, smaller curve would probably make sense. And again, you don't want to sit around and just let it get worse and worse. So now just to, before we find out what happens to the flower, we're going to talk a little bit about the emotions around treating a kid with a cast or brace with early access scoliosis. So there's a lot of emotion here. It's time intensive. And there's a lot of challenge of unknown. We have got little kids that are treated in race, and we don't really fully understand the natural history of these kids because it's a little bit different for everybody. The way I think about treatment for early onset scoliosis is if plan A doesn't work, there's 25 more letters in the alphabet. So you have to be prepared for a journey through early onset scoliosis that may make multiple branches along the way. So this was a blog written by one of my patients, and she sort of described her path of emotions as she sort of treat, treated her as we treated her kid over the past. And the first thing she felt was sadness. Right? So she couldn't hug her child the way she usually did. She wasn't sure when he was upset whether or not she could console him or why he was upset. And also it was tough. Every two months he had to go off to the operating room to get a cast and see him go off to sleep. And then there's this anxiety. So if you have had anyone see a cast, what's happening in the curve? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? What's happening with the x-ray? And then this is a pretty rare circumstance. All of you are here because you're interested in this and it's a community, but in your own community, not many people are going to have this, so finding people to understand your situation is a huge challenge. But then she found strength in her family, so they were able to adjust, and it became part of their life, and it just became part of their routine. Then ultimately, she was very proud, because these kids are little warriors, so kids can figure out anything. There's a reason I take care of kids. They adapt. This cast does not slow down these guys at all, and they really can do it. So how does the story end? Well, not always, but in this case, we know that casting and bracing is not necessarily easy. It can delay or cure patients in a number of cases. And we can try to help grow them straight. So in this case, he carefully took off the straw. And in this case, he got the flower straight. So, that's it. Up the road, uh, Marty Morrison uh, at uh, Loma Linda. We're talking about conservative care and neuromuscular scoliosis. Sir? Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm in charge of the task of talking uh, about conservative care in neuromuscular scoliosis. So we're going to define what neuromuscular scoliosis is because it's a big topic. And uh, for our purpose of talking, conservative care is going to be anything non-operative, including what Dr. Glassbacher just talked about. Casting. And so what is neuromuscular scoliosis? It's anything that's non-idiopathic. So it could be um, a, neuro a neurological problem, or it could be a muscular problem, but it's anything that's non endopathic, non congenital, and non syndromic. So often we see patients in clinic, um, and this is what we assume that scoliosis is like. Um, but it's not just an x ray, it's a patient, and there's a whole host of problems that we need to uh, learn how to control. Obviously, we see the, the curve of the spine, um, we see pelvic obliquity here, we see decreased lung volumes, as we heard, problems with probably a dislocated hip. There's a G2 with maybe nutritional problems, and GI dysmotility, which can lead to other problems. So the general basis of treating neuromuscular scoliosis conservatively is the treatment of each individual's underlying disease, which is very different in every case. And so our main goals are really to prevent progression, maintain a patient's either independence or mobility, and prevent worsening, and then eliminate the complications associated with scoliosis. So what is the conservative care? Like I said, it's not, it's any non-surgical intervention. And so you can see here, um, there's wheelchair modifications, there's walkers that maintain independence, there's all types of braces and adjustments um, to allow the core musculature to try to challenge, uh, beat off the fights of gravity. 
it is a spectrum of care, and observation is part of the care. And we, we want to make sure that this, this curve is not getting worse. Um, and obviously progresses and monitoring of this associated condition is probably the key element. There are some medical treatments for some conditions, and bracing, orthoses, and other durable medical equipment such as uh, gait trainers, walkers, and uh, wheelchairs are very helpful. So if you look at non-surgical treatment options of neuromuscular scoliosis, there are three items that came up on the search of all the literature, whereas there's over hundreds of surgical treatment options. And so this is kind of the unknown, and most of it is the treatment of the underlying disease and the variability of the dif different neuromuscular diseases. So first observation, clearly just observing and finding out what helps, what doesn't help. You can see a progression here, but you also see other things. You see the G2 appear, you see uh, decreasing lung volumes. And so observation is good for younger patients, mild curves, and less involved neurologic patients. Medically, if you have a spastic condition such as spastic cerebral palsy, possibly antispasmodics such as baclofen, uh, uh, intrathecal baclofen pumps, um, can help decrease that muscular imbalance. Uh, for some of the muscular dystrophies, medical treatments such as steroids or teflazacord might be helpful. And uh, this new um, breakthrough drug, Spinraza, for the help, help of a spinal muscular atrophy can be delivered intrathecally um, to prevent progression of the disease course and hopefully slow down the progression of scoliosis. So what does monitoring entail? Well, it's not just the spine. Um, this muscle imbalance may lead to hip problems and hip subluxation. That further leads to more pelvic obliquity, which leads to neuromuscular scoliosis, and the vicious cycle continues. And so we want to really treat the whole patient, not just the spine. <coughs> you can see here the pelvic obliquity increasing, the, neuro the neuromuscular scoliosis associated with it. So the thing is, treat the underlying condition and prevent the imbalance. So hip screening is a big part of it. As part of uh, spastic patients, we often uh, screen them yearly for both their spine and their hips. Um, and then accommodative measures, if they become wheelchair bound, you know, giving time is out of the wheelchair, balancing their wheelchair, um, making flank supports, head supports, shoulder supports, wheelchair modifications, these all can lead to um, uh, prolongation of the curve progression. So I get asked a lot of questions about, uh, what about bracing uh, for my child with neuromuscular scoliosis? Well, it is a very, very controversial topic, and obviously every child is different. Um, but usually, these are treated only with patients who are very minimal involvement, have idiopathic like curves, don't have severe progressive curves. The main time to be only be used as a temporizing measure, just to buy some time, as they talked about, um, until surgery is more uh, safe and feasible. Um, but just remember that it's preventative early, it is not as successful as patients uh, that are neuromuscular, and sometimes it's even harmful. And so I like what Rob Lark says, he says bracing is often used. Uh, to help with positioning and provide temporary control until surgical time is more optimal. And this is kind of, I think, a shared consensus in our community. Um, bracing can have unintended consequences. Um, it leads to a restrictive lung disease, which is also an underlying problem they have already. It can lead to more reflux and aspiration. Um, UTIs, muscle weakness, if there's nutritional uh, compromise, you may have pressure sores or wound healing problems. And these are all unintended consequences of this brace. So in summary, it is a very relentless curve. Uh, we really need to treat the underlying disease process. Every one of those is different. We want to delay curve progression because the more severe involvement, often the more rapid the progression, uh, accommodative measures, and always weigh the risk and benefits, and at first do no harm. Thank you. On scoliosis, the first thing to focus on is the kid, and you know who's at home with them, how do they get their nutrition? Uh, how are their lungs working? Are they getting sick? You know what their birth was like. You have to get a picture of the child. What they enjoy doing. What are the goals they have made? So I think that's the first one. I think everybody sort of agrees. Anything to add? Understanding the cause. I mean, you know, uh, <clears throat> unlike idiopathic scoliosis in adolescence, which we, you know, we don't know what caused most time, we can often find, or more often find, an underlying cause and younger kids, so you just want to make sure you're not missing anything, so you've got to take a careful look at it from that standpoint. Uh, it's very important to know what causing scoliosis. Uh, we talked about uh, the uh, growth of the spine, and uh, we know uh, when we have more growth potential early on, 
there's more uh, uh, chance of correcting the curves, uh, growth uh, modulation and so on. But at the same time, you know, if you start treatment early, especially with surgery, there would be probably more complications. So how do you balance this as far as the decision making that when to uh, do either non-operative or operative? Um. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I think it's a, it's a really hard question. I think it's uh, very individualized. Uh, I think every patient is different and some of it's where they're presenting and some of it's how quickly things are evolving for them. Um, you know, the interesting thing about conservative measurements versus surgical is that the, the concept is that surgery is hard and conservative is easy and the reality is that conservative Conservative is likely just as hard as uh, as sometimes the surgical management is, um, and so it, it, you know I think really the mindset is with surgery it's going down a pathway that you can't really come back from, and at least on the conservative side, bracing or casting, um, I think there you're one you're stalling that surgical pathway, but. You can you can kind of fluctuate between the two. Um, I think it you you don't feel quite as you're now starting this pathway that you just have to continue to the end. Um, and I and, and I think that uh, everybody is ready for that step if they need to do that step differently, including myself. So I don't know if I have a definitive answer for when to start uh, going from a more conservative to a surgery. I think it's really individualized. Sure. I believe the, the last speaker just quickly made reference to negative effects of bracing and neuromuscular versus idiopathic. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, you know, a lot of the uh, a lot of the negative effects I think with really with regards to bracing are probably related to the underlying condition of the patient. So in the idiopathic patient, uh, where lung function maybe not as tenuous. Uh, Possibly their nutrition is better. Uh, a lot of times, the tolerance for brace, the ability to wear braces, is, is easier, um, and it doesn't have these negative consequences. Um, for patients who, for example, probably the biggest concern I have with the brace is the is its effects on the lungs themselves. Um, and so, in the neuromuscular population, where their underlying disease further exacerbates that. Um, I think you, sometimes we set them up for a worse condition by, by prescribing a brace. Um, and that's, I think, where you just start to realize that, you know, the management of scoliosis isn't just about the spine, and it's how our treatment affects the other parts that are involved in their care. Is that a related question? Sure. So you guys all talked about pulmonary function. Is it good or bad, then, to do any kind of long exercises or long strengthening exercises? Uh, yeah, I, so I, uh, I don't think we know the answer. I, I mean, uh, you know, we have, the early onset world is sort of still very unanswered, um, which is good and bad. It means technology is moving in a fast pace. So, you know, when we talk about how do we achieve our outcomes or what outcomes are we looking for, ultimately we care about pulmonary function. But it's really hard to even understand pulmonary function in really young kids. Getting pulmonary function tests and in young kids is almost impossible. And it's the same in the neuromuscular scoliosis world. Both of those populations, it's very difficult to get the outcome that we care the most about. So we're constantly looking at these other things to see if they make a difference. The problem is we could institute something like pulmonary exercise or something like that, and it's not, probably not going to hurt, but I, we don't have a good way to measure if it's making a meaningful difference. Any other questions? When you talk about the book, I think, um, and with kids it's tough, you know, the, those exercises aren't the most fun. I think it's more important just to encourage play and activity. So uh, that's therapy for these kids, okay? And um, so I would want them, you know, a lot of kids do well with horse therapy or getting in the pool or just crawling, playing, using their standing frame or walker. Whatever you can do to keep activity uh, is going to be helpful. More probably for overall health than anything specific to the spine. Big body can all the neuromuscular are the same as far as responding to brace or would you you know maybe sub classify neuromuscular? That's a great question because everyone is not quite the same. So um, obviously depending on what neuromuscular condition we're talking about, there are 
spastic types, which are have very high tone. Uh, there are paralytic or flaccid types, which may be a little bit more amenable to bracing. Um, and then what their ambulatory status is. Um, bracing and wheelchair don't really go hand in hand very well together. And so I think, um, just, like Samit, just like Samit said, um, I often get requests for wheelchairs and kids who are ambulatory because their parents don't want to hear them complaining. And that's actually doing worse for your child because they do they have less time to work on their core muscles that they're usually using to prevent the scoliosis. Uh, we've been talking about uh, different type of surgeries in the after, in next session, and there will be another panel. So we won't get into different techniques. Uh, what any other questions that uh, you have? I know. Well, yes. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Glassbecker, you mentioned uh, risk with uh, serial casting uh, as anesthesia. Is that just a general risk, or is there evidence with children that? <coughs> So there's no real good evidence in children right now, but it's a very hot topic in the pediatric world, especially the pediatric anesthesia world, because um, there's like basic science data where they've looked at exposure of animals to the same agents at higher doses in kids get can affect brain development. From a theoretical standpoint, we're taking kids who are in a very rapid point of neurologic development, brain development, and we are giving medicines that can affect the brain, right? And so we we think about it a lot more than I think we even did five years ago, but we don't know the answer, and a lot of what we're acting on is basically theoretical concerns as much as anything. Now, that being said, if I can cure a kid and I need to get him in a cast, I, I put him in a cast, I'm going to get a cure, because if you wait too long, then you can't, you lose that chance. So you have to weigh those, those risks and benefits. I think the risks and benefit, you always should think about whether it's surgery or casting or bracing, there's risks and benefits to both sides, so you could avoid the risks these, that we're thinking about with anesthesia, but then you have to then accept the risks of the curve being progressed. And so and that, that calculus can be different for different families. Same thing with surgery. Right? We know early surgery is high risk, but then progressive curves have high risk versus bracing casting. And that's a discussion you should have with your provider, and ultimately, um, it's the parent's job to make that decision. There has been some interest uh, from Far East that doing the casting without anesthesia. Any of you are doing it without anesthesia? I think I, I, I think I would struggle to put on a high quality cast, and I think I run the risk of actually creating pressure sores or not getting a well fitting cast if I do it awake. I'd rather efficiently do a cast under anesthesia and get a really effective, well working cast. And especially with the increased use of technology. I, mean, I think some people say the iPad <coughs> anesthesia is probably the same as the general anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I would agree. I think that the reason that you put them to sleep is that you can get a better cast on. If, you know, the reason not to put them to sleep, in my mind, you can make a brace, but you're not pushing them on the hardware as a brace. So if you're going to put on, you might as well put a brace and duct tape it on, right? And then that would be the equivalent, because the problem with the brace is it comes on and off. Um, so I think that the anesthesia's real benefits, I can manipulate it at, to a higher degree. And I, I think that, uh, you know, it's a, little bit, it's a little bit like talking about the use of x-rays and radiation. It's, uh, I think the awareness is there that we want to minimize radiation exposure. And we do want to minimize anesthesia. And so there are things that, you know, may influence the uh, amount of months that we'll keep in a cast. Uh, you know, it used to be that every patient that had diagnosis at early onset would get an MRI right away. But we realized that a two-year-old who needs an MRI also needs anesthesia to get an MRI. So I think a lot of times now we're, we're, we're manipulating our treatment pathways to minimize those risks. We for surely took a lot more x-rays five, ten years ago than we do now. And uh, I think as we start to learn this, and, and again, the families and parents are becoming fully aware and are truly advocating for less risk and we understand that. And so I think we're manipulating and we're going on this journey together and uh, hopefully that, I think as long as the awareness is that we want to minimize these risks are there, and hopefully we move in the right direction. Anyway, I'm getting the signal, we have four minutes in the break and uh, we'll probably continue the discussions yeah. with the faculty. Uh, I'm ready to be able to show us already for getting all the kind of questions. Thank you very much. 
and we'll see you back in the next one. Yeah, we still have uh, the, the family. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>